Anybody who's been paying that much attention to me knows that once I start on something, I just keep going. And until I hit some sort of hard stop, I will keep iterating on the process until it becomes, well, something I would have never imagined at the beginning. Such as it is with VHS tape, which quickly turned into Betacam tape and now lives as Umatic tapes. Umatics are some of the most finicky, bizarre, and also rewarding tapes I've ever dealt with. And along the way to making Umatic tapes work, I learned a little bit more about myself and my relationship to the very unique life cycle of machines. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Umatic is now obscure enough that there are people who may not even know what I'm talking about. It has another name, three-quarter inch tape, but what it represents is the 1970s and 1980s nearly top-quality way to provide storage for video signals. There are actually even better formats, like one-inch tape and so on, but three-quarter inch was just big enough to be able to give you a top-quality signal while also being small, encapsulated, and mobile enough, just contained enough for a TV station or video production house to use. The Mark Pines collection that I've been working with has a whole range of tapes and a whole range of formats, and it's been quite a journey to find out what each of those formats represents. VHS was self-evident, Betamax also easily able to be figured out, and previous work that I'd done with the Game Developer Conference had exposed me to Betacam, so these formats weren't much of a surprise. Umatic was another beast entirely. Besides being large and clunky, they were also shockingly short, sometimes two, five, or ten minutes in a form factor that felt like a shoebox. This was from Mark Pines's professional career, where he worked for a New York editing house and then went into business himself and had either personally involved himself in projects or was involved in duplicating or providing three-quarter inch tape between different entities and customers. Starting out as I had with the VHS tapes, I found a whole variety of recordings of bands and clubs, interviews of people at fashion shows and art museums, along with gallery openings, street recording, and home movies. Getting past VHS tapes in the hundreds allowed me to see different trends and different focuses of what Mark Pines had worked on. But one thing was clear thematically. Mark had involved himself in music and art and fashion, recording other events and people to provide them with memories of what had gone on and a record for others to use. In the storage unit where all these different tapes lived, I looked at some of the other larger professional formats and knew there's probably going to be something pretty interesting there. But I focused on getting things right with VHS tape, working with others to come up with a process that would be consistent and able to be done while I did other things in the background. Besides being careful about doing what I know, there was also the consideration of sourcing and acquiring a deck capable of playing these more professional formats. Finally, I'd reached a point where I was comfortable enough to consider moving into the Umatic format, and looking up on eBay for some potential Umatic decks to buy, I started to run into the eternal calculus of working, cheap, and dependable. Umatic decks haven't been manufactured in a very long time, and there are known models and which ones you want to have, along with the fact that they all have, to various amounts, lifespans. If you're buying a professional deck, or frankly 
any piece of equipment, the reason it's fallen into the hands of the seller in the first place may be that it was discarded for no longer working as well as it could. And unless it's professionally refurbished, you're not going to like what comes in the mail. It's a randomized gamble as to what you're going to get. And I found a Umatic deck claimed to be running in Brooklyn, New York. And I drove down one night in front of a gardening store. Somebody came around a corner with a Umatic deck on his shoulders and he sold it to me. I drove it home and the next day I brought it to my office, plugged it in and it sort of worked. And that's when I realized two things were true. The tapes that Mark Pines had in the three quarter inch format were special, well worth the trouble to make them digitized. And the rumors I'd heard about the dragon I was bringing into my life with a umatic deck was also intensely true. I'm coming to you now, hands dripping with oil and grease and dust, bringing this umatic from merely functional to working. And this is a position I didn't think I was even capable of, much less one I would find myself in anytime soon. You see, for everything that I talk about in terms of digital manipulation and working with applications, mechanical tasks are not, by any stretch, one of my strengths. And it's frustrating, looking back, how difficult it was for me to do something as simple as taking something apart that had all of its parts intact and then reassembling it only to find out something wasn't right, that I had forgotten a screw here, a, a manipulation there, maybe a calibration or a tuning or bending one piece of metal in one direction or another and being totally at sea as to what to do next. With code, I can look at what's happening. It's a language I can understand. I can see things referencing other things, settings and pieces that tell me what to do next. But hardware, which you would think would be an even easier process of tracing backwards, confounds me, has always confounded me. Luckily, this has kept me out of the back of a plugged-in television or hands deep into something that has blades on it. But in the same way, this other half of the hardware-software ecosystem represents a dangerous and hazy fog to me. If I'm lucky, I'm able to read directions, go in and quickly change the one or two parts, and then I scamper out of there like a screaming haunted house visitor shaking inside of their little car when it leaves through the doors. And part of that, I think, is a lack of patience. There's something so quick and so involved, perhaps even automatic with software that I find, where I can use other software to evaluate the software and find out where I'm doing things wrong and fix it instantly. But finding out that three layers down I brushed against a wire or didn't tighten a screw represents pain beyond pain for me. How will I fix this, this thing that wasn't working as well as it was before, and in fact, may be broken forever. I came to terms with this weakness, this blind spot, years ago. But here I was, in my fifties, deciding perhaps this was another chance to make it right. Now, with videotape machines, there's a series of rubber bands that move between the wheels and the loading mechanisms, and rubber, after a while, dries out becomes brittle, doesn't have the properties that made it useful for that machine in the first place. The different levels of flexibility and friction it provides when working with a variety of tapes. So researching the replacement parts for the Sony VP5000 that I had, I found an enterprising company that sells a little baggie with four rubber bands in it, each of them the perfect size for replacing what's gone wrong inside of the VO5000. Is it overpriced? Surely. Could I have done it myself? Probably not. 
And somewhere in the middle of there is what I'm actually paying for. The fact that this vendor knew exactly the sizes that needed to be done and sent them over to me very quickly. So, as I was loath to do so many other times in my life, I began to take apart this beautiful, massive mechanism. And looking inside of a regular VCR, it's already pretty intimidating for me. You see a large wheel that doesn't look like anything on this earth, combined with a whole variety of heads and gears and circuit boards. And whatever that feeling is with a relatively cheap VCR feels like a whole other level of fear for me with a U-Matic tape drive. Because a U-Matic machine, once you take the cover off, looks like some sort of unholy alliance between a centrifuge and a microscope crushed down into a mess of wires and screws that I couldn't begin to figure out the theory of operation. Luckily, this bag of bands came with a link to a PDF. And in my opinion, that's what I was really paying for. A small repair document telling me exactly how to take things apart, pulling apart the gears and interlocking pieces, and then replacing their rubber bands before putting it all together and praying again. That little bit of instruction, for me, was the difference between success and failure. And when I had placed everything back together again and looking down on this obscure, bizarre arena of machinery, I popped in a tape that before hadn't really worked, that had been nothing but static and black and white flashes. Truly, as if by magic, these beautiful images of the early 1980s television industry came out playing perfectly. The triumph and the wonder were in my hands, allowing me to start digitizing these tapes, these 40-year-old vaults of video history. Now, the three words that have come to mind in the days since are not happily ever after, but perhaps and more broke, because it turns out that umatic drives and tapes in the 21st century are some of the most finicky pieces of precision equipment that I'm probably ever going to have to deal with. I'm sure in their prime, they were unstoppable beasts, truly industrial equipment that could take any amount of abuse and work, providing television stations with broadcast quality images off of these tapes, played again and again for commercials and for shipped-in television shows that they would broadcast and for provided specials that they would play on the air on a regular basis. But years of service and decades of time had worn my machine down into the crankiest bucket of bolts that one could ever want to deal with. Like the realm of science fiction, where machines are miraculous and do incredible things, but are also a few sharp hits and a lot of sparks away from success. This machine needs constant, constant babysitting. The VHS decks that I use, JVC branded and with a series of acronyms that I've long lost track of, are really capable of taking all sorts of tapes under all sorts of conditions and dealing with them. They clearly are built for circuitry where you didn't know what was going to be on the next carriage at any given time. But a three-quarter inch U-Matic machine expected industry standard top quality tapes and its reed heads and gears were meant for a very specific period of time that was long in the rearview mirror. So what I am finding at this point is that every single tape that I put in is a bittersweet, nail-biting adventure. I put the tape in, I watch the machinery loop the tape around the reed head, and it all begins running. And if I'm lucky, I get a beautiful, functional image that I can then digitize and put onto the Internet Archive. But more often than not, I get static, dropouts, odd tracking, and all sorts of indications that the mechanism needs cleaning again. In fact, multiple people that I've been consulting with have told me 
that it's not unheard of to have to clean the mechanism after every single tape. Every tape, whether three minutes long or 30 minutes long, eventually causes the head to become clogged again, and you have to clean it using alcohol and a wipe and carefully brushing against it so as not to damage the mechanism and merely take away any grit that's preventing the signal from being read. It is involved. It's an operation. And I've signed up to do it at least 500 times this year. I'm standing now at the beginning of working with Umatic. It's going to be a long and perilous journey. I can't imagine that this deck will be the one I'm using at the end. There's going to be ups and downs, tapes that I'll read four or five times trying to get it right, post-processing that will make them functional, while also doing all the other activities that I do as part of my job and my efforts. In other words, this process has the potential of being quite intimidating, but I've learned over the years, when I face down thousands of potential tasks and hundreds of potential hours, no amount of doubt is acceptable. Focusing on what I can't do or how much time it's going to take is not going to change those real concrete numbers. All I can do is focus on the process, celebrate every new tape rescued from the abyss of this medium with this welcoming, supportive crowd of people who have been watching me go deeper and deeper into this wonderful task, and with me hoping that if I ever get out of my depth, if I ever find myself too far gone, that maybe some of them will think to rescue me. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Josiah Lucher, James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Eugene, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Much more pressing for me is less the functionality of the Umatic than its size. At this present moment in time, my little office that I rent to do all of this work is filled with all sorts of videotapes, decks, and servers to get the job done. It feels like a bunch of obscure machinery sitting on top of even more obscure machinery with wires running between all of it. And I'm sure, in coming weeks, I will address this problem. But it's always funny to me how I always find myself in this exact position over and over. Perhaps it's just a common side effect of what I focus on. But those moments when you are trying to build a whole new way of processing information, of bringing in and then shipping out things that you're working with, it can look pretty intimidatingly messy. It can become something you're concerned is out of your control. But with the same focus and with the same hopes that I am approaching this umatic deck, I'm sure that I can get this bizarre machine, this one that has me at the center, running as smoothly as possible any day now.